Hello everyone, I am back with a new video, and in this episode I resume my second part of the Duna mission. We're right back into the action, and as as you can see, we're already over Duna since that's where we left off. We've completed the Ike contract now, so we can just focus on the Duna one, and as you can see, as I mentioned in the last episode, I've come in at a really shallow uh, descent trajectory because of how thin Duna's atmosphere is. I've got five parachutes on my design, although, oh no, sorry, uh, six of them, seven even, but I don't know if that will be enough to fully slow myself down because of just how thin it is. Also, I haven't unlocked the uh, larger size parachutes, so um, the drag won't be quite as great. I can now start uh, taking some science samples and using the new uh, barometer that I purchased for the mission. This provides a lot of science data, and along with crew reports and everything, uh, I get quite a lot. Also, uh, since Duna has an atmosphere, I can get science from whilst flying at Duna, which only exists, for that biome for some reason only exists on a sub-orbital trajectory, so doing a flyby won't give you that data, it has to be a lander. Or at least uh, get into sub-orbital, then back out again. Now I'm setting up one of the parachutes, as you saw, with the tweakables as a drogue chute which has just opened because that'll help reduce the um, g-force experienced at one instant on the ship. I have in previous run-throughs of my Cobalt Space program uh, playthroughs have experienced problems where all the parachutes open at once and then the command prop breaks off or something. Now this way hopefully the g-force was sort of spread out a little and as you saw there briefly the uh, total g wasn't as much as it would have been. Now, although the parachutes have slowed myself down a lot, the uh, the uh, speed is still quite a lot. And actually, uh, th this is a lot quicker than I would like. Oh, oh no! I'm gonna, I'm not gonna fall over. Oh no, 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 no! Oh, I'm gonna have to burn retrograde. I hope. Come on, come on! This is relatively flat. It should come on. Oh, oh, oh there we go. <laughs> that was close. Whoa! Oh, I. Every landing in the series hasn't gone quite to plan, but okay. Well, there we go. At least I'm, at least I'm up right now. The center of gravity of this part of the ship is very low because uh, it's quite squat, so that's that's pretty proved useful. Although I've landed on a very flat area of land, it is quite high up, I'm about 4,000 meters above the theoretical sea level. So the atmosphere. As you can see on the sort of atmospheric gauge at the top in the UI, is still sort of nowhere near the bottom. Even if I land an extra 2,000 meters lower, the parachutes would have kicked in and be probably going an extra 5 or so meters per second slower. The science data on Juno is where we can now start uh, bagging some real expensive stuff, and that'll hopefully allow us to spend a lot of science points on the big uh, mission, on the yeah the big mission that I've got planned for the next episodes. I hinted at it briefly in the last episode, but uh, I'll talk about it more a little later, but it's going to be very costly. Now, of course, it's now time to get out, take some more surface samples and EVA reports, and of course, plant a flag. This is a very important flag, as it now means that the Duna system has been conquered. Jebediah Kerman is now the first person to not only visit it, but visit both, both bodies in the system in one launch. The flag there isn't quite illuminated by the sunlight, but we can now still plant it. Yes, as I said, the red planet, or that red smudge if you squint as you, uh, from the uh, Kerbal Space Center, as referred to by Kerbals, has now been conquered. We can now move on to greater projects, but still, we can get lots of science data from this. And as you can see, we've now also completed the Duna contract. Overall, this mission has been up until now, a success, but we still have to focus on recovering the vessel. Just before I get in the command pod, I remember to repack my parachutes. You can do this by right clicking on them, and I only learned about this fairly recently. And although staging them won't work the same way as uh, when you haven't used them before, I mean, if I, if I hadn't repacked the parachutes, my landing on Kerwin would have been uh, interesting. In previous designs, before they allowed you to repack parachutes, I'd have a specific stage of parachutes just to activate later on. Although the jetpack does work on Duna, it only works just. I think Jeb needs to lay off the snacks or something. But 
uh, he does manage to get back into the Kermar pod, and now we can focus on getting back home. I've landed very close to the equator, if not on it, which it makes getting into orbit a very easy, well, getting into a nice orbit uh, much easier. I've also got more fuel than I'd thought, and although in my previous episode I mentioned that this was an asparagus stage, uh, I made messed up with the symmetry, so now all four tanks lead into the center one, rather than having an asparagus staging, which would be more efficient. Now, you're watching me, uh, as you're watching me uh, wait until Kerbin is aligned with Duna to get the optimal uh, return trajectory, um, I thought it was worth noting that, um, although it was slightly shaky landing just then, uh, considering my first Duna mission in the series went uh, pr pretty well, I've got to say, that uh, beats the odds of real-world missions. Uh, as of August 2013, only 16 of the 39 orbiters, landers, and rovers have been successful, which isn't actually, those, those odds aren't very good. And also, uh, yes, at the moment I'm just uh, trying to, I realised that my flag had gone. So I go out and plant another flag, I'm not, <laughs> after some rolling around, I'm not sure quite what happened, but I saw in the map view that my flag disappeared. I mean, that occasionally can happen with fast travelling, but um, yeah, I don't know what happened. So I, anyway, I plant another one. And that's all the problems I experienced with that, but yeah, that's what I'm doing at the moment. And now, yeah, I've already repatched the parachute, so we don't need to worry about that. And there we go, all of our science goo canisters have now also been used. So, uh, yeah, this, this ship now looks very nice with all of its experiments used. Now I'm just going to wait until I'm a little bit further around the planet so that from Duna, I'm not going to be getting into orbit and then circularizing doing tweaks. I'm just going to attempt to go straight from Duna uh, ascent to Kerbin, or at least get near Kerbin and then I can tweak it once again to solar orbit. And there we go, the engines are ignited. We are now lifting off, and I'm not quite at full throttle just for the moment, so that we can get up and unlike on Kerbin, we have to do a, we, well, we can afford to do our gravity turn a lot earlier because the atmosphere is so much thinner and the gravity is less. I'd say Duna has a really nice uh, balance between the gravity, which is just enough to use the EVA pack, but still has uh, enough sort of cool rovers as well. But you get the feeling of being low gravity, and you also, although the atmosphere is thin, you can do parachute-assisted landings and make planes. I think it's got a really nice mix. It's one of my favourite places to go for sort of cool stuff like that. And now, yeah, you see I can just get a straight uh, hopeful Kerbin encounter. I'm pretty close. I might have to do some tweaking once I get into solar orbit, but I'm not going to be getting into Duna orbit first because of how I time walked around the planet. I'd recommend getting into orbit first if you if you're sort of new to this kind of stuff. But um, I had uh, done some planning in this mission, although nowhere near to the degree that I will be doing in the next few episodes. I suppose it's a good time to start talking about that now, actually. But, uh, yeah, just before I do that, I'm just making a new maneuver mode, as I said, to tweak my orbit to get a nice curve and encounter with a low periapsis. And the fuel in the outer stages has just been depleted, or is about to be, so you'll see the separation. Yeah, sadly, it's not asparagus staging, but still relatively efficient. Anyway, so in the next episode, uh, well, at some point in the series I thought I was going to have to land on some of the more difficult planets. Uh, Tylo's up there, Eve is the easiest place to land on, outside of the Kerbin system, but one of the hardest to get back from. And also Moho and Elo are all pretty hard, so I thought I'd get, uh, I thought I'd go for Drez. I thought I'd decide to get Drez done and out of the way so that my crew mode is sort of more freed up and I can focus on more other missions. But then, with the success of this mission, uh, I thought, yeah, I'm getting the hang of doing multiple planets or moons in the same trip, so let's attempt to do another one. And then I sort of included Elu in my mission, so I went on doing Drez and Elu, and then, at the last minute, I also thought, let's get Moho done. So, in the same mission, I'm planning on going to go from Drez, then to Elu, and then to Moho. Yeah, um, I've never done anything like that before. I haven't, at the time of recording this video, 
I hadn't planned it, and um, yeah, I'd never even been to Moho or Ilu ever, let alone incorporate them into another mission, or even just get back from them. But uh, yeah, I mean, it should be fun. I've never even docked before, ever. So I might fit in a little bit of practice, but yeah, so I hope you'll tune to the next episode, or a few of them, it's likely to be at least four episodes in the series, a mini-series of episodes. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a big challenge. And yeah, with no uh, quick saves, well, this is going to be cool, but yeah, I'll give it a go. I mean, if it pays off, I should be getting a lot of science points. Also, um, chances are I'll have contracts to go to at least one or two of the places mentioned. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I should be getting well into the multiple thousands of science points for that mission if it works. However, as I said, I mean, if a mistake happens, I'm just going to have to live with it. I'm not going to be reverting or doing anything, so it'll have to be either a really cool and complex rescue mission, or, yeah, as I say, it'll pay off and then, wow, that'll be, that'll be really cool. Never done anything like that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I've learned quite a bit from my Kirby series at the moment. I've played it before, as you may know. But, um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I've lear I feel I've learnt enough. I've never even been to Duna and Ike in the same uh, launch before. I've never done any two of anything in the same launch. So, yeah, I mean, I think I'm stepping up. Now, we've got a pretty nice Kerbin encounter. Fairly, well, we've got an, a planned low paralysis. I'm just doing some final tweaking to get down. We can obviously do the rest once we get to the Kerbin system. But look at that. Yeah, I mean, that's a really nice periapsis. I have very little work to do once I get into the system. And there we go, we can now look at the uh, final sort of uh, what's left of my giant rocket that I originally launched. My rocket cost uh, roughly 171,660 funds in Kerbal. And compare that to the recent uh, Mars mission by India, which cost $74 million. That's quite a big difference. I mean, I don't know what the exchange rate between dollars and funds would be. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the sort of balance that we're dealing with. So I, I'd, I, I'd guess my mission would be relatively on the cheap, but I don't know. I mean, perhaps you've done ones that are less costly. Now, at the moment, I'm just trying to get into a nice circular orbit because I'd hate to do all this uh, quite big mission and then land on water because if you land on water, you risk having your ship break apart. And sure, landing on land does mean you could land on a slope and fall over, but uh, that's sort of manageable because you can then use torque and sort of rockets to sort of uh, alter your landing spot. But if you land on water, I mean, you've just got to hope you're going slow enough. So I'm making sure that, although it's not equatorial, I'm just getting into some orbit, even if it is polar. Actually, polar isn't too bad for this because it means you're very likely to land on land because there's land going pretty much all the way around the planet at some level on the poles. So yeah, at the moment I'm just getting my periapsis down so I can choose some form of landing site. It might even be the poles or the tundra just because uh, those are new biomes and that would be pretty cool. As you saw, I forgot to mention it at the time, uh, I used the last Mystery Goo canister uh, in solar orbit because that gives quite a bit of science. I didn't do that originally and I forgot to use it in the Duna system. However, actually kind of disappointingly, the science gain from solar orbit is actually more than in the Duna system even though it requires less effort. Anyway, so we're here, we've got a nice uh, landing spot without having to do too much waiting. We're just going to land on the land here. I don't know if it's flat, but it should be good enough. It's going to be as good as any. Again, um, I'm using, from my, as I set up originally, I'm going to be using that parachute as a sort of drogue chute to open about 250 meters earlier than the others, uh, just so that yeah, the g-force is less extreme because I'd hate my vessel to break up at this stage. I mean, <laughs> oh, I'd hate that. And I've also got a spare uh, barometer that I, I think that I can use, uh, yeah, there we go, that I can use sort of in, yeah, um, just in the high, high above sort of atmosphere. That'll get me a little extra science, only a tiny bit, but it's all worth having. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much science we get from this mission, but it is quite a, quite a bit, sorry. We've luckily just missed 
that mountain range that I nearly went past, landing just before it, and I don't, th I don't think we quite make the tundra biome. But that's the least of my worries now. I'm just trying to focus on landing safely. We've also ran out of fuel at the moment, so yeah, I'm just gonna hope that the parachutes do their job. They should. I've got three parachutes to slow myself down, and the rocket doesn't weigh too much. I didn't include any science juniors because they weigh a lot, but I do have a lot of mystery goo canisters. I mean, I don't know, I've got landing legs. Could go either way, but I'm pretty sure it should be fine. Now we began to slow down quite a lot, and unlike the uh, Duna mission, I don't have to worry about too much about the height that I'm landing at, because the atmosphere I'm covering is a lot thicker. You can already see on the uh, atmospheric gauge that the needle is already at full. There we go, the du Drogue parachute has already opened, and yeah, six and a half meters per second, that's exactly what we want to have a sort of nice uh, steady landing. We could go slower, but six and a half is, is plenty, I mean we'll have a nice Guaranteed safe landing if we go at this speed. And then we go, yeah, Jebediah. He'll be the first Kerbal to come from and back from uh, deep space as well as from another planet system. He truly is a Kerbal hero. Now, sadly, it almost annoyingly, this, this part of the mission takes ex an excruciating amount of time. I wouldn't want to time warp, but landing does take some time. Uh, there we go. We've landed. Look at that. And yeah, we've landed very low actually, but lovely. It's a flat landing spot. We've landed on land. I mean, what more can we ask for? There we go. We can now focus on recovering the vessel. Just checking any more crew reports, but no, I mean, we've already been into this biome. And there we go, 2,080 science points. Wow, that's a lot, and look at all the funds we got as well. Only a tiny bit of reputation, but that's good enough for me. I'll see you in the next episode.